Bishop Rowan, thank you very, very much for agreeing to have this conversation on Etty Hillison with me. It's a, a, a great honor and a privilege to be able to hear what you have to say about this great woman who um, uh, I will ask you to, to tell us a little bit about her, but also perhaps for the sake of our viewers to say that uh, it was your mentioning of her in your talks on prayer, uh, a series of six talks I think you gave on prayer some years ago. And one of the ladies you mentioned uh, in those talks was Etty Hillison, and that sent Doreen, my wife, and myself on a quest to find out more about her. We read the diaries to which you refer, and, uh, and we're immensely grateful to you for having talked about her in those talks. But uh, what we would really like to do now is hear um, from you uh, something you talked about her in the context of prayer. Um, and what I would like you to talk about now is, first of all, to tell us something about her, who she is, and then to say how you think her message has a particular relevance and a helpfulness in our current predicament. Mm. Thank, you thank you so much, Reza, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about somebody who's, who's so important to me. Etty Hillison was um, a Dutch, young Dutch woman from a Jewish family in Amsterdam. And her journals paint a very vivid picture of this extremely intelligent, extremely unconventional young woman discovering herself and discovering her world in the Netherlands in the late 1930s, early 1940s. She didn't come from a practicing Jewish family and quite clearly her own coming to terms with her religious Jewish heritage was a very significant element in her process of maturing. But we meet her first in the journals as a young woman in her early to mid twenties, um, fascinated by philosophy, fascinated by literature, wanting to make a living in the world of literature, translation and so forth. And she's also leading a, a fairly, you might say, unconstrained kind of life in other ways. She had one very, very um, significant teacher with whom she had a, a long affair. And yes, her life was not what you'd call the, the normal life you might expect from someone to whom you look for spiritual insight. And yet, in the middle of all this, she is relentlessly questioning herself about the kind of humanity she wants to grow into. She's not satisfied simply with um, the rackety life of a brilliant student in Amsterdam. She wants to go deeper and she looks for charismatic teachers to help her on the way. But during those years, she's reading Jewish and Christian scriptures. She's reading St. Augustine. She's reading Dostoevsky. And she is gradually moving towards a more um, overtly spiritual sense of who she is. And her life begins to change. Not overnight, not with a sudden conversion. And she's somebody who still stands very much on the borderline of traditional religion. She doesn't simply go back to her ancestral Jewish practice. She doesn't convert to Christianity. But you can see her absorbing the depths of these traditions and moving steadily towards the heart of things. So this is the point at which she also has to face the greatest crisis of her life with the Nazi invasion and occupation of Holland and the threat to her as a Jewish person. Eventually, she, with other Jews in Amsterdam, was rounded up and deported to Auschwitz, and she was killed there at the age of 27. So it's a short life and a very packed one. If I were asked to identify two major discoveries and insights in her writing, which have moved me deeply, which seem to me of massive importance, they would be these. The first is her very moving description of how she found herself 
as it were, constrained or compelled to express her spiritual discovery physically. She speaks of being forced to kneel down. And she says, I, the person who said I would never kneel to anyone or anything, I have to kneel. And that's, that's a very remarkable moment in her journals. She is acknowledging that in body and soul alike, she has to accept, well, a kind of submission, not a humiliation, not a conquest, not a brutal erosion of her personality, but she has to bow down, she has to kneel before a reality that is so much beyond her comprehension that all she can do is give herself over and expressing it by kneeling. And I find that, a, as I say, a very moving passage because clearly she's not, not finding it easy, but also because it, it challenges me and challenges a lot of modern attitudes to the spiritual. We sometimes think, well, the spiritual is internal, is mental, um, and really what we do physically doesn't matter very much. There are religious practices which people um, adopt or which people inherit, which involve the body, but those are just incidental. And I think she is saying, no, if we really are body and spirit together, then both in and out of our worship, the way we inhabit our bodies is part of our, our faith, part of our response to the Almighty. So that's one thing which I take very seriously. The second is um, perhaps the most profound of her insights. And it's something which comes to the fore as she reflects on her experience awaiting deportation to Auschwitz. She's in the, the holding camps of Westerbock um, in the Netherlands. She's surrounded by people in huge confusion and distress, people of all ages and backgrounds. She also has to confront the reality of the German soldiers who are guarding the place. So, what she says is, this is a place where it's very hard to see the hand of God. But that means if I truly trust God, I must be in part the answer to that question. I must take responsibility for God's presence and God's faithfulness and God's love being visible. And that strange phrase which she uses, taking responsibility for God, I mean, on the surface, it's, it's the most bizarre of phrases. How could we possibly? But I think we can understand what she's saying, that in situations of pain and terror, a person of faith is called to step out and to be there on behalf of God, their presence, their love, their faithfulness, is given into the hands of God to be a sign for others. And that is a really, really remarkable insight, I think, about the life of faith. And she, she comes back to that more than once, her own presence in the camp, her own engagement with others, is quite clearly formed by this. And there's another very deeply moving passage where she describes confronting one of the camp guards and thinking, here is a, a confused, frightened young man who has been caught up in unimaginable evil and pushed to the forefront of the action of evil. How do I respond? And she says, I have to try and see the frightened young man behind the uniform. I have to extend some kind of understanding, some kind of empathy to this person who is as much a prisoner as I am. And in, in some contexts, people might say, oh, but you know, that's a, a sentimental or a, an evasive thing. This, this man is representing evil, has to be resisted. I don't think that Etty Hillison believed we, we had to be sentimental about this. She simply says it is a fact that the person who does evil and the person who suffers evil are both caught up in a kind of prison. And part of the role of the person who suffers, especially the person of faith, is to bring into that terrible situation of imprisonment something that is different, something that is new. So, sorry, it's a long answer, but something about her life, something about her character, and those two really central features 
of how she responds to the, the unimaginably terrible crisis that she faced. The last words in her journals, unforgettably, are as they move off towards Auschwitz on the train, we left the camp singing. And that still causes the hair to stand up on the neck. I think she knows the terror she's going into. But she is determined that for that moment, she will take responsibility for another reality, another truth being visible. You're reminding us of that. Yes, I, I, re I remember she wrote this on a card, I think, didn't she? Uh, a postcard. She wrote out of the train window, yes. She wrote out of the window and it was found. Yes, and um, can we just go back, Bishop Rowan, to um, the beginning of what you said and, and her, the, the affair that she had with her teacher. Um, uh, was, was this the person who also gave her some kind of psychotherapy? Was he a psychologist? That's right, yes. Um, looking at the story, we would now quite rightly, I think, identify this as, importantly, an abusive relationship. Somebody who exploited his position um, by exploiting a patient sexually. Um, and yet, of course, she refuses to see herself as a victim. And it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult aspect of her life. I think I would be easier if she, if she protested more about it. But... I, I seem to remember that she actually has some passages in which she expresses the, 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 the profundity and the totality of her love for this human being mm. Mm. in a way that made me think that perhaps this was a, a foretaste of the love that she would be able to transfer, as it were, to the, the source of all love. She certainly was completely overwhelmed by this, this passion. And maybe we can look at that and say, yes, objectively, there can be no doubt this was an abusive relationship. And yet, perhaps one thing that she grew into was the sense that there are certain kinds of passion and certain kinds of self-giving which are appropriate only to God, only to the Almighty. And I would have been intrigued to know what five years later she might have said, looking back on this relationship. So nothing to justify it, nothing, I think, to absolve this particular teacher. And yet, and yet, something is discovered in that for, for her, by her. And she, she makes of that elusive, difficult, and deeply, deeply ambiguous relationship something that can be the ground for taste, as we say, something else. I don't know, it's, it's, it's a difficult territory, aren't they? Yes, and if I could then go back to another thing that you said about her uh, need to actually physically meet yes. prayer. Um, could one see a, a relationship between that overwhelming need to physically prostrate to God and a commensurate strength in her ability not to kneel to the Nazis. Can one see a relationship then? I think this is absolutely crucial, isn't it? I think this is, this is the heart of how faith works in times of terror and oppression and violence like this. The, the recognition of the sovereignty of God for so many people throughout the centuries, has been a recognition that no other power has that claim upon them. And so, as all our traditions say in one way or another, our sense of absolute obligation to and surrender to God is the source of our deepest freedom. So, when St. Augustine speaks of our service as a kind of royal position. Um, quem servire regnare est, whom to serve is to reign. That's, that's such a powerful way of saying the claim of human power upon us is never total, never complete. 
and what the love and obedience of God gives to us is that space that no one else can occupy. Now, one of the people that um, Petty Hillison met in Westerbock was another of the great figures of the century, um, Edith Stein, um, who had been uh, a professional philosopher in Germany and a very, very creative, very remarkable and sophisticated intellectual, again from a Jewish background, she had decided to everyone's surprise after the First World War to become a Roman Catholic and then to become an enclosed Carmelite nun. She wrote many wonderful works on the life of prayer. She had been sent by her religious order to the Netherlands from Germany to escape arrest by the Nazis. But they caught up with her, the convent in, um, in the Netherlands. And the story goes that when she was summoned to the parlor to meet the military officers, they greeted her as usual with the salute Heil Hitler. And she replied, Laudator Jesus Christus, may Jesus Christ be praised, as if to say, that's my, that is the sovereignty to which I answer. Yes, that, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, would it be fair to say that it's only in one's submission to what Etty called a power that is higher and greater than the Nazi party, to that supreme authority. Is that the only way we could have access to the psychological strength, the, the strength of character that Etty manifested at such a young age, in the early 20s? Yeah. To, is that the only way, or would Etty say that that there are strong people who can resist the Nazis with their willpower, with this or that, or would she say that, no, you need God? I think she would say, this is something you can't do with your own willpower. Whether you name it and speak of it with the fullness that a person of faith might do, you, you will still implicitly be believing that there is something if you like something sacred, something protected within you, which can't be touched. There are people of supposedly secular convictions who in effect believe something like that. But I think the Christian, the Muslim, the Jew, the Buddhist would want to say, fine, but what you're talking about is what we mean by that sacred core of reality, which is the divine image and the divine presence and action within us. But if you don't have that conviction that there is something completely immune to attack and defeat, something which is simply true, whatever the world says, I think it is impossible in the long run. And the danger of a, a completely secular society, I think, is to my mind the danger of a society where people have lost the sense that there is some sacred space within everyone, something wholly inaccessible, unchangeable, held in the hand of God. And again, I remember a conversation in South Africa about 30 years ago with a very celebrated leader of the church in South Africa who had been subject to a great deal of persecution, imprisonment, harassment. And um, I recall after our conversation saying to him, I just want to thank you for, for being the person you are because you are so important. Um, an example for many of us, hard words to say, but you have to say them sometimes. And he shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, you know, there comes a point where you realize that they, they can't touch you. And what he meant was, they can't touch you. They can't touch that sacred core which is held in the hand of God. And that's what gave him the courage to do what he did. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much. I think that um, that's a, a great note on which to conclude this, this short conversation. Um, and uh, uh, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought, and it will help many of us to go back to the diaries and to read them and hopefully 
to uh, bring into our, our present struggles in the face of this crisis, this global crisis, and mm. derive some uh, inspiration from Etienne Hillis. Fearlessness in the face not just of of death, which is always there, but of this encroaching evil that is full of unknown pain and suffering. And yet she she transcended and she helped others to transcend it through her love of God. So uh, thank you very much, Bishop Ryden. A deeply grateful. Thank you.